This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey guys, Jade here. Thanks for joining me today to learn about quantum superposition. So if you're just starting out on your quantum physics journey, quantum superposition is a really good place to start because it's very fundamental to quantum physics. And basically, if you don't understand superposition, you aren't gonna understand anything else about quantum physics. Before we start, I just wanna say that um, I know quantum physics has this really intimidating reputation, um, but really I find that the problem with most people in learning quantum physics is that it, it's this kind of mental barrier and it's trying to fit the results or the observations of quantum physics into a model of the world that they know and understand. And I'm just going to tell you right now that, that that's not going to work. So, um, so for the next 15 minutes or however long this video ends up being, just keep an open mind. Anything is possible. I really think anyone can learn quantum physics. It, it's not hard. It's just odd. <laughs> so yeah, with that, let's get right into it. Quantum superposition. Here we go. So I thought the best way to do this would be to simply describe the results of an experiment and then talk about what the results mean at the end. So say we've got a box of neutrons. It can really be any quantum particle, but I feel like neutrons are often neglected because they're probably the most boring particle, having no charge or anything. I'm a middle child and can sympathize with being forgotten, so neutrons, it's your lucky day. Now I'm going to steal a beautiful analogy from an MIT professor, Alan Adams. It absolutely blew me away when I heard it, so I wanna share it with you guys now. Say it's an empirical fact that neutrons have two properties, color and shape. In the real world, this would be analogous to spin, but spin is a kind of complicated topic and you really don't need to understand what spin is to understand superposition, so just forget the real world for now. Now, neutrons can have two colors, blue or green, and these are binary, meaning it can only be one or the other. And it's the same with shape. They can only be circular or square. No curvy turquoise squares allowed. Now say we want to test whether color and shape have some kind of correlation or relationship. So someone has built two machines that can sort them for us, a color machine and a shape machine. So when a neutron is fired from the neutron box through the color machine, the machine sorts them into blue and green groups. So just quickly, this ambiguous wiggly cloud represents that we don't know their shape yet. It isn't the actual shape. And likewise with the shape machine, it sorts them into square and circular groups. The machine doesn't in any way change the neutrons, just sorts them. Now the actual mechanisms of the machine don't matter at all. It could be a tiny demon inside doing the sorting or it could be magnets and other fancy expensive equipment. The point is that these machines have been built and they work. Nothing described in this experiment has anything to do with the mechanisms inside the machine. So you fire some neutrons into the machine and it sorts the blue and the green. Interestingly, we get an exact 50-50 split. The same thing happens with the shape machine. Exactly half a circular and half a square. So now to see if there's any relationship between shape and color, we combine these machines in a few different ways. We test how many blues turn out circular, how many greens turn out square, how many circles turn out green, and how many squares turn out blue. We try every combination and find that the answer is always 50-50. It's completely random. As far as we can tell, there is no correlation between shape and color. Knowing one tells you nothing about the other. Okay, fine, no big deal. Now I'm gonna do something and just humor me. Say we send the neutrons through a color box, collect the green ones, then send them through a shape box, collect the circular ones, and then send them through a color box again. What do you think will be the percentage of blue and green neutrons as they exit the third machine? I want you to pause the video and think about it, and then vote in the poll that just appeared. Okay, so if you're a reasonable kind of person, you probably guessed that 100% came out green and 0% came out blue. The first machine sorted the green neutrons out, then passed them through the shape machine, and then back through the color machine. So it makes sense that we'd have gotten all green neutrons here. But it's not what happened. 50% came out green, and 50% came out blue. This is where the fun begins. Now remember, these machines don't change anything about the neutrons, they just measure them. So maybe the neutrons can change color on their own then. Maybe these properties are just ephemeral and they can change at will. 
All right, next experiment. This one is a bit trickier, but not much. We have the random neutrons from the box going into a color machine, being sorted into blue and green, then the green ones are sorted again by a shape machine. Now these things are mirrors, and they don't do anything to the neutrons except change their trajectory. So the square neutrons take the upper path and bounce off this mirror, and the circular neutrons take the lower path and bounce off this one. Then they're all recombined at the beam splitter and sorted again by color. The beam splitter doesn't do anything except recombine the square and circular neutrons and then send them through the color machine. Just for clarification, let's assume the neutrons are being fired one by one, so they're not interacting with each other in any way. Now think really carefully about this one and cast your vote. What percent emerge from the final color machine blue and what percent emerge green? Feel free to backtrack and take a look at the previous experiments. So in the last experiment, we unexpectedly got a 50-50 split between the blue and green neutrons. We had a color box, a shape box, and again a color box, exactly the same as what we have here. So it would be reasonable to guess that we get a 50-50 split again, but we don't. 100% of the neutrons came out green and 0% came out blue. So what the hell, right? Remember what we said about keeping an open mind? Next experiment. Let's block this lower path here, the circular path, with a wall so that none of the neutrons can get through. Furthermore, let's make the paths a million miles long so that the neutrons taking the upper path couldn't possibly know what's going on with the neutrons in the lower path. Of course, neutrons aren't sentient or anything like that. I'm just using the word no for lack of a better word. So with this new added wall, let's cast a vote again. What percentage of the neutrons will emerge as green and what percentage will emerge as blue? Again, feel free to backtrack. I'm very interested to know how you guys voted this time, but I'm just gonna tell you. Half turned out blue and half turned out green. What is going on? Open mind, open mind. Okay, so if you think you've digested all of that, let's try and make some sense out of it. In the first experiment, we sent the green neutrons to be sorted by shape. But then when we measured the color again, half were blue and half were green. So we knew the shape of the neutrons that came out, but not the color. In the next experiment, we introduced a couple of mirrors and a beam splitter. We sent green neutrons to be sorted by shape, recombined and then sorted again by color. And this time, 100% came out green and 0% came out blue. So what changed? Well, did you notice what the difference was when we introduced the beam splitter? The recombination meant that we didn't know whether the neutrons entering the final color machine were square or circular. So from our perspective, it's kind of the same as if the measurement was never taken. So in the end, we knew the color, but not the shape. Hmm, I'm sensing a pattern here. All right, then what about the next experiment? When we blocked the circular path and sent the green neutrons through the shape machine, half came out blue and half came out green. These are the same results as our first experiment and from an outside perspective, we have the same information. Because we blocked the circular path, we know that one, the electrons which passed through the first color machine are green, then the ones that make it to the final color machine are square. But then when they pass through the final color machine, they're not green anymore, they're random. It seems like we're not allowed to know both the color and shape of the neutrons at the same time. But what does that mean, not allowed to know? Like, it's not like neutrons have some vendetta against humans and are playing some big practical joke. And even if they were, this path is a million miles long. How did the neutrons taking the square path know that there was a wall blocking the circular path? So let's try to explain this experiment. Let's focus in on the second one, where 100% came out green. What did the neutron do in this area of mystery here? Well, there are really only four options that make sense. One, it went along the square path, but when we blocked off the circular path with a wall, we know it took the square path, but we got that half the neutrons were green and half were blue. So we know that's not it. Two, it took the circular path, but we could just use the same argument switched around. So we know that's not it either. Three, it took both paths. Maybe the neutron is sneaky and split in two or duplicated itself or something. But if we place a detector along both paths, we find that only one neutron is ever detected. 
So that's not it. Four, the neutron took neither path. Well, if we put a wall in the way of both paths, we find that no neutrons come out. So that's not it either. But there is a fifth option, and that's just that the neutron is doing something that we can't understand. It's not taking the square path, it's not taking the circular path, it's not taking both, and it's not taking neither. It's doing something entirely different. And the word we use to describe this behavior is superposition. The neutron was in a superposition of being square and circular at the same time. We can't know both the shape and the color, but it's actually deeper than that. The neutron doesn't have a shape and a color at the same time. Having a definite shape means not having a definite color. To talk about the shape and color at the same time doesn't mean anything. Measuring the shape resets the color and vice versa. There is something fundamentally unpredictable about physical objects. Quantum superposition, ladies and gentlemen. This experiment has been repeated many times with different particles, neutrons, electrons, protons, photons, buckyballs, and it always turns out the same. The original experiment was done with the spin of silver atoms, and it's called the stern gerlach experiment, named after its creators, Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach. If you are interested in learning more about the weird and wonderful world of quantum mechanics, Brilliant.org has an entire course dedicated to quantum physics, starting off with a detailed description of the stern gerlach experiment, including all the physics behind it, as well as the notation used to describe spin probabilities, called bra ket notation. It includes interactive step-by-step -step quizzes so you can learn at your own pace and check your understanding at every step. The course also covers the math used for quantum physics and takes you all the way to Schrodinger's equation. And something I absolutely cannot wait for is the quiz on quantum entanglement coming soon. Not to mention all the other courses included on the website, mainly about math, physics, and computer science. The first 200 people to click the link below and sign up will get a 20% discount. Just go to brilliant.org slash up and atom. The link is on screen and in the description. So I hope you guys were able to understand a bit more about quantum superposition from this video. If it still feels pretty fuzzy, don't worry. Quantum physics takes some time to settle in. And you have to remember that we didn't evolve to understand these kinds of concepts. Back when we were cavemen and women, we were thinking about how fast we had to run away from tigers and uh, the trajectory of throwing a spear. We had no use for knowing how quantum particles worked. So it's not surprising that we have a hard time understanding it and a, a hard time forming an intuition. Understanding quantum physics is going to take some brain rewiring and that's going to take some time. But just keep trying, uh, stay optimistic and I promise you one day this stuff will kind of start making sense. I've linked Alan Adams' MIT lecture down in the description. I would strongly recommend it to anyone um, looking to learn more about this topic. It's pretty easy to follow and his enthusiasm is just contagious. So with that, I'm going to end the video. Good luck on your quantum physics journey. I do hope you pursue it. I will be doing more quantum physics videos on my channel. So if that sounds good to you, then subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.